Okay, good evening everyone. Just get my PowerPoint up. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Maybe just give me a nod, yeah. Okay, good evening for everyone. I'm Andy Suggett and I work at Northumbria University. Um, great to see so many, so many familiar faces and names uh, alongside there. Um, hi to everyone I worked with at York, Exeter and elsewhere. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, a project I did uh, whilst I was at the University of York um, working with some of you here tonight and we were investigating um, the extent to which uh, butterflies might find refugia from climate change. I'll say a little bit about um, exactly what those are um, a bit later and uh, but first I probably should say a bit about climate change itself. I mean my introduction to this issue gets shorter every time I give a talk because it's becoming more and more prominent and um, Really, the first time I saw it, well, the first time I saw um, a spatial map of climate change on the front page of the sun, um, needless to say, I was really surprised. I mean, let's just put to one side the other things that appear on the front page of the sun every now and again. But um, I was really impressed with the extent to which they were very much on board. And um, it goes to show that what's going on is really noticeable. Um, and when we think about climate change and how it affects um, wildlife, quite a lot of the evidence we have is for species that take advantage of changes that expand into new places, turn up at different places or times to what it should do. But there's a bit less evidence um, about how species potentially are adversely affected or retract uh, their ranges or uh, otherwise as a result of climate change and that was one of the sort of drivers behind the project but first of all I'm just going to say a little bit about what's happening to the earth's climate so many of you have probably seen a graph or a variant of this uh, graph before um, it's this is the recent instrumental temperature record and the changes from um, the 1961 to 1990 average um, that we've observed um, over recent years. And obviously all those red bars show that there's something quite unexpected. I mean, the main thing to take from this is that yes, the climate's always changing, but it's really only since about um, 60, 1970 where it's kicked in properly. And that's with the advent of what you might call global industrialization as opposed to a more localized uh, process in the western world before that. Um, obviously we keep getting hottest years on record, last year was one of those if but not the hottest. Um, this is just another way of looking at the same data, I hope this gif is going to start playing for you now. So um, all these stencil drawings um, the extent to which they go out towards the outer edge of the plot is in proportion to the change that we've observed um, over 1850 to recent day. Um, it's just another way of showing that at all times of year, um, particularly globally in what is the Northern Hemisphere winter, but all year round, all the time, uh, we're getting changes. And if you look at the more sort of mid 20th century, which is appearing right now. There's kind of marginal differences, but there's an overall increasing trend, but it's the last sort of 30, 40 years ago that it really started kicking in. Now, why might this matter for species? And, and really in one graph, this does a pretty good job of explaining why as ecologists, we're always interested in what the climate's doing. Um, I could show you lots of different climate variables that could be important for different species, but two of the most sort of fundamental that are important to almost all of them are the annual mean temperature and um, the total precipitation amount, which appear on the left and right of the graphic. And as you can sort of see by the map on the left, 
Uh, it really brings out the tropics and I should probably say subtropics as being really hot as well. Britain's relatively unique and um, mild maritime climate that we get from the Gulf Stream uh, is also quite clearly visible there. And, um, you know, there's a sort of common parallel we draw with sort of Canada, Northern Canada. Uh, and that's the sort of climate that we would otherwise be experiencing. But overall, that sort of pattern is clear. Um, and if you look at the precipitation graph on the right hand side, uh, you can sort of see how some of the Western seaboards of particular continents are affected by radically different precipitation regimes. Um, and yeah, good old Britain again is quite dark, dark blue there. There are places in Scotland and the Highlands that do get over two meters of rain per year. Um, but the real message, um, aside from indulging my slight sort of geekery on the climate data front is when you combine these two, you end up with the fundamental patterns of biomes, habitats, and places that species live in. And that includes the four butterflies I'm gonna to talk to you about today, but that's pretty much a fundamental facet of ecology. In fact, um, someone like John Norton would call it one of the most fundamental laws of ecology there is, if there is such a law. Um, if anyone's interested in um, a guide to what he thinks might be the other fundamental laws. He, he wrote a really nice essay in Oikos around the turn of the century um, that puts this really well and into more detail than I can go into today. Um, so the corollary of the fact that the climate is changing and that it's important to species because it defines their habitats, where they can live, etc., is that if species can't necessarily keep up with what's happening, if they can't adjust their ranges, find the niches they need to survive, then um, they could potentially go extinct. And, and really, once it became clear that humans had become the predominant driver of the Earth's climate, and that the impacts on species started to become obvious, Scientists started asking the question, okay, well, if this warming trend continues, then how many species may not necessarily be able to cope with this? And um, uh, a former colleague, Chris Thomas, was one of a team of many people. And I should say lots of teams that have worked on this since that estimate a sizable proportion of species could be committed to extinction and you know I it felt a long way off when this study uh, came out 2050 obviously we're almost halfway there from that original study and again made the front page of the paper at the time and um, people are starting to take notice um, and uh, just to sort of make the point that this is causing uh, real and observable effects on um, wildlife. Uh, again, taking that example of Britain, where we have some absolutely fantastic uh, citizen science data uh, that we can use to examine this, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, we can look across all the, um, you know, the major animal groups, which we have good data for, and we can ask, okay, well, are they moving north, a bit like this uh, lovely map of the comma butterfly that appeared in State of UK Butterflies report. Um, and hard to believe the comma wasn't really anywhere near Yorkshire, um, even as late as sort of 70 to 82, but it's, it's a sign of the times that it's, it's pretty much reached, or probably has reached the northern tip of Scotland by now. Um, but the point is, when you look across all the groups and the different coloured bars are just a different way of doing the analyses, they're not necessarily that important because they mostly show the same thing. Species are moving north um, <clears throat> and a 
across the groups, most of them have done so to the tune of sort of 50 kilometers in the latter half of the um, 20th century. So that is the equivalent of a sort of few meters per hour, if you want to put it in kind of like uh, sort of metaphorical terms. Although, of course, as we all know and we all see on the ground, they tend to arrive at lots of sites in pulses and go quite some way in a good year, maybe have a few setbacks as those propagules sort of get knocked back. Um, uh, Susie Mason, by the way, uh, also a, a former York uh, PhD student, she wrote an update to Rachel Hickling's excellent paper. I think that's in um, the Linnaean Society Journal, um, if you want to get the latest figures for those. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what a refugium might be and why it's relevant in the context of these climate change impacts that we are observing. Um, now, the first thing that anyone does when they want to find out about something is Google it. Unfortunately, uh, there's lots of um, aquarium kind of like fora and other chat um, things talking about refugia and refugiums. Uh, well, refugia, the plural, obviously. Um, but what it basically means in this context from climate change is a place for species to potentially pass out some of the more deleterious effects of climate change. So all the mechanisms that drive um, species retractions from those parts where, of their range that might be too warm or too dry for them. Um, if we can find parts of the landscape that, that might um, offset some of those or provide protection from them, then uh, that might uh, help species to persist in areas that might otherwise be intolerable. And we know that this was the case and we know that they can be quite small because um, the warmer species survived the last glacial maximum in areas of relatively warmer refugia um, towards the south of Europe. And those are the species that are around us today. Um, but of course, it was a much cooler time. So if you look at the, uh, the, I think this is pretty much the maximal extent of the ice and the red areas show the refugia. Um, and obviously the ice is kind of ringed by the gray sort of line there. Um, you've got the classical large scale refugia covering most of Iberia, uh, Italy and the Balkans peninsulas. But you also had some smaller areas that were relatively closer to the ice that also offered some level of protection. So this idea that there was just a, a vast ice sheet that enveloped the whole of Europe during this time isn't quite correct. We know this because more recently, with, with sort of um, improved paleoecological techniques and, and better ways of detecting it, and probably more research effort as well, we've started finding species and species records that, have, um, that are starting to turn up in completely unexpected places. That last one was for red squirrel, by the way, off the coast of Norway. And so what this sort of um, kind of predicts from the modern warming episode is that there might be these sorts of areas providing cold refugia now that the climate is starting to warm. Um, and to be honest, any one of us that goes out onto natural sites and finds unusual species in unusual places the, the idea has crossed our minds and I, I made this figure to demonstrate that really. Um, it was a day that um, we took a thermal camera out to just a regular lowland heath site in the southwest of England in Cornwall, uh, right out on the Lizard Peninsula. And for that day I just downloaded the Met Office station data for the instant pretty much that we were using the camera. Um, 
And as you can sort of see uh, across most of England, I mean, Scotland and the Highlands sometimes just does its own thing. But for most of the rest of Britain, it's within five degrees of each other across the whole of, um, you know, if we talk about the central belt right down to sort of southern tip of England. But once we had that thermal camera out on site, as you can see from my um, friend's dog Tassie here um, and the sort of landscape behind her, if you look at the sort of scale bar for the thermal camera, you're seeing differences of 15 degrees. And if we take the dog out of the image uh, and look at the one below and actually look at the finer scale, you get some even bigger differences between the hot rock here in the bottom left hand corner and the cooler, um, like sh almost the sh sort of leeward sort of shaded side of that little mound that this patch of thrift is exploiting. Um, and so, so you do see the potential for these sorts of climates um, to form, uh, even at the micro scale. So what do these sorts of places look like? And I'm, I'm kind of, what I'm doing here is, is referring to the sorts of places that might harbour a butterfly population, a moth population, uh, you know, a viable uh, continuing uh, population and, and I just put some of these examples up of places that I've been um, or done field work in where it really feels like um, the microclimate is quite detached from the wider environment and we can model these places uh, systematically and we get the same answer they're really unusual places and um, in most of these cases they, they've arise from the natural topography. Uh, you know, in the case of Langdale there, Great Langdale, you've got a really steep sided U-shaped valley. Kynance Cove is a very, very tight sort of um, uh, valley down on the Lizard, not far from where we took the thermal image. That's the Rhodoric Forest in the Northwest Highlands is, is kind of pockmarked by these really steep kind of drainage features as well. Look at the shade on that. That's, that's after the uh, spring equinox and there's still most of the valleys in shade for most of the day. And I put Winterbourne Downs in there as a good example of somewhere that actually has been artificially created. But what that um, S-shaped feature gives the whole landscape is a huge amount of topographic heterogeneity that wasn't previously there. And so as you can sort of see by the light hitting one side and not the other there, it's interesting opportunities for species to optimise the climate that they're subject to. Um, and there's a nice definition by Mick Ashcroft in his sort of single authored paper down there. Um, and I quite like that as a sort of idea, um, sort of working definition of what these things are. So, like I say, today I'm going to talk to you about a research project that looked into this question, looked into four uh, potential range retracting species that certainly meet their um, warm range edge uh, in the UK and in similar parts of the UK. And what that allows us to do is conduct a field campaign across all four of them. And we did it across two summers few years back um, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you uh, what we found when we went looking for uh, you know are they retracting and where are they going so as I've sort of mentioned I've, I think I've mentioned some of these already but um, if uh, you know there are some people in the world that don't find butterflies fascinating enough in themselves I don't know who these people are um, but uh, basically we're interested in the refugia for all species and why butterflies are so good for studying those. Well, you can turn up at a site and take a good guess as to whether um, if you hit the middle of the flight period, you can take a good guess as to whether that butterfly is actually on site or not. And, you know, for other groups, say, uh, you know, beetles, like flightless beetles or otherwise. I remember I went looking for once. We hunted skip with common all day 
and we couldn't say for certain whether it was there or not. Um, so if you want to get across lots of sites very quickly, they're a good group to look at, as well as being supported by all those amazing citizen science records, like I say. Um, but this has potentially real um, input into where we're going with environmental policy post-Brexit, because if we can find these areas that might be more beneficial for species, then we can try and incorporate them with how we do conservation, okay? So these are the study species. Um, uh, like I say, all of them meet a cooler range boundary in the northern half of Britain, um, more or less. Um, so uh, you might recognise some of them. Some of them occur in Yorkshire, either uh, legitimately or otherwise, some uh, unauthorised releases. Uh, but uh, obviously mountain ringlet is just lakes and Scotland. Um, so taking you through them just in a bit more detail, I'm sure you're probably all aware of most of these data for most of these species, but just as a brief introduction, um, <clears throat> if you take the um, population index for the Northern Brown Argus, it is starting to show um, something of a decline. Um, it's single brooded uh, right in the middle, well, just after the um, summer solstice is when it tends to peak. As is always the case, uh, it depends what sort of latitude you're at. Um, there's an interesting sort of um, sort of gradient in the sort of colour of the wing spots that you get on the four wings, on the back of the four wings. Uh, all the individuals in Scotland have the white dot. Um, and then in between there and here, there's a bit of a transition. Um, the one in the middle there, I took in the lakes. Um, so it's not quite as cut and dried as, um, you know, darker dots in England and white dots in Scotland. That said, um, there's an obvious potential for confusion with a new, relatively new arrival um, on the scene in Yorkshire and elsewhere in the north of England. And that's obviously the brown argus, sort of southern brown argus, um, Aresia agestis. And um, R Richard Fox at Butterfly HQ has a map of the sites he thinks are northern brown and brown argus. Um, but the only really true way to tell, I suppose, is if you're observing the northern brown at the peak of its phenology, which lies in between the double brooded uh, southern brown argus, but that is obviously far from an exact science because these change every year. Um, I think we can probably, you know, conservatively suggest that anything we see in England now, given that it's turning up even where I am up in Northumberland, uh, could be um, brown argus. Um, so yeah, giving Richard Fox a headache there. Um, so the next species we looked at is uh, Scotch Argus, relatively stable population trend. It is sort of showing signs of uh, decline in uh, its sort of two main English populations, but otherwise this is such a, um, this does really relatively quite well in the Highlands. In fact, so much so you'd almost describe it as a wider countryside species. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 quite, um, it's quite cosmopolitan in its sort of taste for host plants. It's, it, there's, there's two particular ones it goes for, but it's, it can go for other grass species. It's been observed feeding on them. Um, and we also looked at large heath. Um, and actually on the observed uh, transex, it's showing an increase, which is great news. Been the subject of quite a lot of conservation work, probably quite a few people on this call might have worked on um, sort of restoration or upkeep of a, a large heath site. Um, 
maybe on the North York Moors over here. Um, and uh, it's also got this um, latitudinal sort of cline, obviously far more sort of pronounced for this species. And it's more colorful the further south you go, those spots are more pronounced. It's a bit of speculation as to why that might be. Um, but by the time you're in the north of Scotland, you've got an individual which to be frank, apart from going off size and how it flies, it's a lot like a small heath. Um, so it can be a bit of a nightmare where they're both on site and flying together, um, separating those two, but you get your eye in, in the end. Um, again, single brooded uh, species. And the one that we know relatively quite little about, and in fact, we do have transects that monitor mounds in ringlet. None of them are either walked regularly enough or all of them walked regularly enough in the same year or even the same week for us to get reliable um, population data for this species over years. Um, it's the only true montane butterfly. Um, anyone that's been looking for it probably has a story about how they had to sit in the pouring rain or the cloud for all day and then maybe it flew for five minutes um, or maybe not at all. Um, and some of the life history info is conflicting. Um, so Rosa Menendez is doing a lot of good work on this, uh, trying to rear it. Uh, and she thinks that it might even eat different species on different life stages. So um, yeah, relatively short flight period. And that is also quite variable. Um, they can certainly fly as early as the third week of May in a good year in the lakes. And we're heading for one of those at the moment. Um, but equally, I've seen them into August in colder parts of Scotland, shall we say. Uh, and yeah, unlike the others, because this is a montane butterfly and you can see where it's distributed, this is possibly going to be a question of retraction upslope rather than obviously latitudinally, although you may expect sooner or later that these lakes populations come under more pressure than the highlands ones do, given the relatively low elevation and obviously by a slightly warmer climate. And I quite like putting this slide up just to remind us of the overall European context. Um, so the Northern Brown Argus in particular, uh, can be found in lots of other countries um, across Europe, all the way to Turkey. Obviously, if I did what the trick that I used with the climate data and, and these distribution maps, you know, they'd align up to some of the cooler areas across Europe. But still, we should remember that there's a sort of European context to these. But our climatic gradient predominantly runs south to north. So, like I say, the opportunity to survey these range margins in the same places is sort of relatively unique in the UK context, in the European context, sorry. Well, this is the part where I say thank you very much to all of you for being so dedicated because we would know nothing about what this species was doing before um, an upstart like me came along and went out and surveyed them all and Aldina Franco for the previous round of surveys. So um, thank you very much for sending your records. It's so important to what we do. And we really do get millions and millions every year now, um, not just butterflies, but across all sorts of taxa. And um, it'd be very difficult uh, for us to uh, really get a feel for what's going on without that. Um, just to illustrate how many records we get now, Tom August at CEH, Centre of Ecology and Hydrology at the Biological Records Centre there, made this really nice um, GIF of all the records as they come in. It almost look, they almost look like kind of like bombings or little explosions. Um, so Yorkshire sees its fair share of action. Um, but if you didn't think that the, rule, the world was ruled by insects until, until now, you're certainly convinced, I mean, um, once summer begins, it's really all about the invertebrates and mostly insect records there. Um, but a phenomenal effort 
uh, by, uh, like I say, the citizen scientists to put all this together. And that really helps us get to the bottom of this. Um, what this also tells me, aside from the fact that East Yorkshire is relatively empty, is Scotland is also somewhere that we know far less about. Um, and that's probably to our detriment, uh, but it's just a simple fact of uh, where people live, where people choose to go when they go on their nature walks or their holidays or otherwise, and why, again, it was quite important to do a project to study species that live in this big gap so that we can try and fill some of the um, gaps in our knowledge. Okay. So uh, we used uh, the wonderful citizen science uh, records hosted at uh, Butterfly Conservation and the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Um, we looked across um, a mix of the organised efforts in recording um, as a result of both the Atlas for Butterflies. And um, so uh, that's what um, butterfly conservation now called the butterflies of the new millennium data set and we looked for all the records at one kilometer resolution so um, that's a fine enough scale to know what the site is that you're looking at in most cases uh, but obviously um, not so fine that uh, the relative the, co the coverage of the country would be relatively incomplete um, and we looked for presences, so anything that had been recorded as a presence in that era in one of these atlases or over the interim period. Um, we had some information from Aldina Franco's original Reese survey. Some of you might be familiar with this paper, and um, it was really quite uh, unique at its time because, like I say, it provided evidence on warm range boundaries and species retractions where previously there wasn't much at all. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, the extent to which our results align or don't with those surveys, although in broad terms they generally do. Um, but what I am going to look at is the results of a comparison between our resurvey, which was across 2016 and 17, and those original records um, uh, before the turn of the millennium. Um, and that's just a link to our project Flickr. Those are the sorts of things, uh, if you, if you wanna get a feel for what the sites were like that we went to um, for the species um, or what it's like to be involved in a project like this, um, then please do take a look. Okay, so I've talked a fair bit at length about climate change and what it might bring. Um, time for some predictions of what we think might happen. Um, so I would say that given all these are way, uh, warm range edges, we should probably be expecting some sort of retraction towards um, the sort of preferred climatic conditions of the species. And those marginal sites should be the most likely to go extinct. So given that, for our three sort of relatively lowland species, uh, we think they are probably going to move north, um, you know, a bit like this graph from Rachel Hickling's paper. And with the mountain ringlet, as I've already said, we would expect it to retract upslope. Um, so how did we go about trying to see if that's what they actually did? Well, First thing we had to do with the resurvey was establish the status of each site. And uh, we did that for about 100 sites per species. It's more than that, but um, we didn't end up uh, visiting uh, the same amount for each, but it was about 100. We rewalked the um, same transects that Aldina Franco walked in the first place and we use the butterfly monitoring scheme methodology which obviously quite a few of you will use on a weekly basis um, why reinvent the wheel is the best way of comparing across sites um, 
and across years, if that's what you want to do. Um, <clears throat> so, it, you know, anyone that's traced a transect walk, they may look something like this. Obviously, every single one was different based on the rights of way, how easy it is to get up or down the mountain, so on and so forth. Um, but we added, so we spent about an hour or so walking that transect, but we added in a bit of extra time just in case uh, we couldn't find species that we were looking for on site. And that was 30 minutes of extra time. And what we said to the recorders was just go to the areas you think are going to be good for this. That could be a very small patch that you think looked great for it, post plant perfect, little sheltered uh, microhabitat potentially, or it could be visiting one or two or three of the other patches you might think have looked good. Um, and we, but we also did some checks for false positives. So we did a supervised introduction to the study for the team. We mixed everyone up so that everyone learned from each other. Um, and we did use nets in the first month. Obviously, we didn't take anything off site, but it's in the net. Uh, you can be a bit more sure. Um, and we had the latest base mapped GPSs with ordnance survey data so that everyone was pretty sure that they hadn't wandered off the square um, for one reason or another. We also had some checks for false negatives as well. So um, we visited all the fine scale records from previous surveys and from the citizen science data, if there were any. So I'm talking about 100 metre records here. If we had any, we visited them. And this 30 minute contingency, obviously they're natural candidates for going back to. Um, and like I say, we added some extra time if we didn't find the species in the, in the requisite um, hour. And um, we also went back to something like 10% of the sites to follow up those negatives. And I know because I did most of these, sometimes I'd go back two or three times, making sure the weather was just so, um, so that it hit all the conditions of the BMS method. But if it was marginal, I still went back. Um, so we did lots of things to make sure that what we were seeing was actually, um, you know, a genuine, absence. <clears throat> we also looked at habitat quality and by that I mean host plants. Um, so we did basically uh, two transects per site and just looked at the coverage, yes or no, of host plants within those, at those particular points and um, within the sort of vicinity of those. Um, and again, we, we compared those to Aldina Franco's uh, surveys that she did in the same way uh, a few years previously. Um, we also looked at other things that might be going on that could affect the presence of the butterflies. So vegetation height, so I'm talking about management and grazing here, but also potentially um, succession or otherwise. Um, and like I say, we looked at the percentage cover of the host plants. Um, we visited lots of sites across the north of Britain. Um, when I give this talk here in the northeast, uh, I have to make apologies to uh, local members whose sites we didn't visit. Um, although we didn't visit some of the sort of areas that uh, might you know in black there where there are records for our species but we didn't cover them with the purple dots one thing we did try to do was to make sure that our stratification across the range of elevations and climates and otherwise um, across GB uh, we tried to make sure that they were consistent so what these graphs show is uh, the distribution of elevations here on the left-hand panel and latitudes. I could also show you some for uh, mean temperature, precipitation as well. Um, 
These black lines show where all the citizen science records are found by elevation and latitude and, and where we visited. So we, what we want to avoid doing in the case of say elevation is sampling too much from sites at lower or higher elevation that may affect our estimate of what proportion of sites might be going extinct. Same with latitudes. So um, I think we did a pretty good job of both overall. Um, yeah, so this, this is just the field campaign in numbers. In fact, this is just one of the two field work years. So um, I can tell you that in 2016, we surveyed for 12 weeks. Um, we used 3000 person hours of field time 17 person field team, not all working at once, but uh, at any one moment we had sort of eight to 10, more like eight working in the field uh, simultaneously. We stayed at 13 bases, we covered 15,000 vehicle miles, walked 359 transects, and saw 3,500 butterflies. We actually only had 10 rain days that year that were total washouts. Um, and on one of those rain days, we went to watch one edition of the Highland Games. Um, and at the moment I made that figure, I'd done 51 uh, days of data entry. I think it probably overall for the whole project, it was something like half a year's worth of person effort for that. The graph in the bottom right hand corner um, shows you know, our accumulation of sites per week and the overall, shall we say, the synoptic weather for that week. Hottest week of the year was the first week we were doing the surveys and everyone was learning the technique, which was great for introducing them to all the butterflies, but it was uh, quite an intense kind of few days, really. Um, and the top right shows you what a cow can do to a tape measure. OK, so. Our key question, um, and the one that I'm going to answer with the results and the findings from uh, the project so far is, are these species retracting to these long-term macro refugia? And is that consistent with a response to climate change? But with um, the northern brown Argus, it's definitely uh, showing signs of a latitudinal retraction in Scotland question mark in England, and that's largely down to the hybridization zone and potential uh, confusion with uh, southern brown Argus that might be arriving at some of these sites. Got um, a pretty clear cut latitudinal retraction for Scotch Argus moving northwards, but not for large heath. Um, and we did find that mountain ringlet is moving up slope, even if you account for changes in host plant uh, cover. Um, so I don't like ending the talk on a bit of a bum note, especially when it comes to range retracting species. Uh, I don't want to say that there's uh, nothing we can do and we should just kind of let them all go. There's lots of things we can do. Um, we need, I mean, you know, if I was ruler of the world, we do studies like this on all the species uh, that we had and on a regular basis and um, add to those amazing data we collect from citizen scientists to get a much better idea what the risk is to all species of conservation concern. OK, but we can certainly do these sorts of exercises like Wendy Foden uh, outlined in plus one. Uh, where we look at the potential risk from climate change and, you know, sort species into one of these categories. Um, we can look to see if there's a way of managing and facilitating change. Uh, obviously, we've got to be a little bit careful because that might invite the range expanding species in. Not much of an issue with butterflies necessarily, but certainly for plants and other things fugal species might be at risk from being outcompeted. So there might be ways in which all that valuable, for example, genetic diversity, um, like Melissa Minter found, 
uh, in the Lake District, um, there might be a way of um, helping that um, survive, but um, that might involve translocating them if the boundary that they've got to cross that sort of adverse um, climate that might be stopping them from moving from site to site is too big. Um, so this Iberian lynx here is a good example of a species that really would have its climate optimum somewhere like the UK by the end of the century, but there's no way it's going to um, make the journey across lowland France and then the channel to do so. Um, obviously, there's a huge role for protected areas. Um, there's an upcoming British Ecological Society report that looks at the potential role of protected areas under climate change and the future of them, given um, the post-Brexit uh, policy environment. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I think the release date is coming up pretty soon. Um, but needless to say, we should continue to and enhance the protected area network that we already have. There's also more that we could do to reduce the other threat. And, and this um, somewhat innocent looking flock of chickens um, is responsible, you know, in, in some cases, just as an example, uh, my PhD field site at Skipwith, um, the local managers were really worried about nitrogen deposition coming from a nearby chicken farm. Um, and obviously, uh, some quite well publicised issues uh, on the why at the moment. That's just one example of an issue that if we mitigated other threats, um, then we're giving the species a better chance of survival with or without climate change, but obviously reducing that kind of multiple stresses phenomenon that we get. Um, but it may be uh, for species like something like the ring oozel on Dartmoor, dare I say. It's popular, it's charismatic, but with five to ten breeding pairs, uh, somewhat less now, there may not be much we can do. Um, okay, so that's the sort of end of my kind of church format talk. Um, but before we uh, go to questions, which I'm really looking forward to, I just wanted to thank the amazing team of people I worked with uh, to do this. Um, that includes my PhD supervisors who I uh, went back to work for on this postdoc project. That's Jane Hill and Chris Thomas. Worked with an amazing team of people. I think I saw one or two in the audience. I hope you're going to pop up and ask a question. Um, and like I say, all those amazing citizen scientists uh, at Butterfly, you know, that submit records to Butterfly Conservation, CEH, the BSBI, really important. Um, and yeah, if, if any of this has sort of piqued your interest or you just want to find out more, uh, send me an email. Uh, or like I say, we've got the Flickr that's got a bit more about the project. I could also send you a few bits and pieces if you send me an email as well. So thank you very much for sort of tuning in tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, if you don't mind, I perhaps ask the first question. Um, I've got a bit of experience with the mountain ringlet and going to hunt it down over in the Lake District. They seem to be very, very particular about where you will find them. You can suddenly literally walk into, cross up to the top of a small hill, all of a sudden you'll start to see them and what looks like the same habitat only 200 meters further on, you'll suddenly not see any at all. So in your work, have you come across, I mean, do you look and see whether you can think there are other sites appearing? Is, I don't know the data well enough to know, have, have they started appearing higher up on the hills um, and in new sites? Because obviously the lakes has got potentially lots of opportunities for sites for them, but uh, they do tend to be in isolated pockets. So. Yeah, curious. Um... So yeah, I mentioned Rosa Menendez. She's uh, trying to get a better feel for the fine scale data uh, in the lakes. She does her absolute best to try and keep some of those transects walked at least a few times a year. Um, I mean, I've been in meeting with local meetings with local conservationists where I almost 
you're talking borderline fight erupting over the best way of surveying this species because yes we use transects but they're so ephemeral that um you know some people swear by point counts a bit more like what you see for high brown fertility or otherwise um they are local um perhaps less so at the one kilometer scale that we worked at but We'd go to these sites and it would really be, uh, yeah, of all the species, it would be the biggest challenge to sort of try and find where they might be. I mean, in words, what I would try and look for, uh, these sort of, I'd call them sort of like, almost like a, what you're looking for is like a grassy platform within the site so you, you, you're given the coordinates and if you're lucky it's 100 meters um, but you're looking for these grassy platforms um, they need the sun which for a cold you know species that meets its warm range edge in the UK especially if you're going to the lakes some of those really low sites it feels a bit counterintuitive but of course any butterfly prefers to fly in the sun regardless of its climatic requirements um, yeah, so it's like smallish grassy platforms where things might level out a bit and there's the potential for a bit of shelter, but no one is an expert on that butterfly. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the other thing you may have noticed, I mean, if you've been to somewhere like uh, Morehouse Cross Fell, you're up at seven, eight, is it 900 metres, the summit? Um, you can be, and the points where you can be surrounded by Nardus, Stricter, um, Matt Grass. And, you know, so times like that, I scratch my head and I'm like, mm, why, why are you not here? Uh, but yeah, still a lot of work to do on that one. Yeah, Heart, heart Sop Dodd is where I've had most experience and it is literally, you, you crest the hill, you see them, you walk another 300 meters, then they suddenly disappear and the habitat <laughs> looks exactly the same. So nice right yeah, so, so if anybody's got any other questions for andy please put them on the chat so i've got a couple here already andy um one from carol uh, who's from dorset said so we've talked about a few butterflies here which new species do you expect to see naturalizing here in the uk in the future Let's <laughs> it, keep it to butterflies yeah oh i mean that's a fool's game isn't it really i mean some of the ones that you'd expect like right on the coast France, Netherlands, otherwise like Queen of Spain for Tillery, not made the journey. And who would have predicted something like scarce swallowtail? So I am going to dodge that landmine. Um, <laughs> could be anything. I mean, here's what's odd. And maybe you've had this thought as well, Carol. Um, why do the moths do it so much more easily? Um, you know, OK, lots of them are better flyers. Maybe they're more habitual as well um, in terms of how far they disperse, but still. Really interesting question that. I think the sudden small white, isn't it, is one of the ones they're expecting to be nice. appearing quite a lot in the, in, in the south of England fairly. Yeah, well, Just another time, thing yeah. for me to get angry about on Twitter when they don't come to Northumberland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pete, Pete's asked, can you extrapolate from the four species you've looked at to any other species? Well, I, so, I mean, it's quite a common refrain for people working on butterflies and moths to talk about them as indicator species. And I, uh, I do have colleagues that work in the Alps that look at some of the many Arabia species that you get there and they have a pretty good idea that something similar is happening um, uh, so I think it's it, it's pretty it's pretty safe to say that latitudinally sooner or later all species are going to face that pressure but how it happens in practice is often uh, either some accident or what I hope will be the design in the management of particular sites. Uh, so if you, if you kind of, if you up the condition of sites as much as you can, probably that site will 
persist for slightly longer than you might expect, even if it's under extinction debt. And that just raises the probability, however slightly or otherwise, we don't really know, to be honest, of some sort of dispersive individual making the leap to the next site. And like I say, that sort of genetic diversity isn't lost. Um, and who knows, it, for a site that's in very good condition, you could have a situation a bit like I showed with the last glacial maximum and the maps there. They may persist throughout the entire um, warming episode. Dennis has just made a comment going back to Carol's original question, uh, the previous question. Pyrrhus Mani, which is the Southern Small White, um, we've commented on already, is rapidly moving through Europe, and obviously we're expecting to see it on the south coast of the UK before too long. And of course, the large tortoiseshell people are seeing yeah. that, of course, now. Um, and they're finding eggs, and obviously they're finding a number on the south coast of England. And as Dennis has also pointed out, the long tailed blue certainly has managed a few years of. Uh, breeding down on the south coast recently so uh, and again presumably that's all climate change so. i know peter on his uh, uk butterfly site has an excellent guide to distinguish small and large tortoiseshell um that he's put up recently um sort of last you know whilst after shortly after it was happening and um i certainly if i was ever in the vicinity of some of those sites i'd print that out and take it with me for sure So we've run out of questions. Anybody else got a question for Andy? Um, I could ask a question. I don't know whether you've got uh, um, the answer to this because it's a bit specific, but um, the refugia, um, there's one in uh, northern Germany, Netherlands. It seemed a slightly curious sort of chunk of land. I was wondering whether you knew uh, what, what it was that actually um, generated that. Ah, you've got me there. So um, it's been a little while since I read, I think that's John Stewart's paper, who is actually down in Dorset. I think he's at Bournemouth these days. So perhaps there's some explanation in there. I agree. Why would it be? Uh, what topography there seem would be relatively benign, right? It'd be something like the Wolds, maybe, as opposed to something major. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, uh, how how to get a look at the paper? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, yeah, I'll dig out the full reference if you like. Um, and you can send it to me. I'll forward it to Rolf. Great. You. Yeah, 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 sure. Thanks for that. Den Dennis is just making the point that it's very difficult, extremely difficult, actually, to distinguish the small white and the southern small white. You really have to get your eye in. <laughs> it's all about the dot on the uh, four wing. And it's a pretty subtle difference as well. So, yeah. Um. <laughs> Martin, Any I have questions, a question, Andy. Adrian. Yes. Hello, Andy. Um, you'll have to forgive the naivety of my question, but I'm new to the group and I'm pretty unfamiliar with butterflies' biology. So, when we're talking about extermination of their habitat. What exactly is it that we're, that's disappearing or changing? Is it the food they, they, the, the caterpillars live on, or is it the co you know, cover of the vegetation? I noticed you measured heights of vegetation. What's, what are those factors that are being involved? I mean, uh, so I have colleagues that spent their entire careers answering that question. Um, I, and it's a very good one because really uh, you're starting getting into the things that a butterfly as an organism requires from its environment and it does require lots of things um, and actually a part of that habitat is the microclimate that it's ex experiencing really um, in a stricter sense. That said for this study um, because we were working with butterflies and we know that, that they're highly responsive to the host plant that they eat in the larval stage that I was basically kind of using a bit of a almost like a slang term when I meant host plant so I probably could have been more specific there um, but uh, what we tend to find is that if the host plant is at a site and it's in good condition then all things being equal um, if the species can reach there 
or for example if it's being reintroduced then it should do okay there as long as the climate's all right for it of course so, so does that so affect the number of offspring they have or are they very con consistent in their reproduction numbers and it's just well you know, does that the environment make them reproduce more or again that's that really depends on the species uh, sometimes you could with particular groups they're more or less predictable so the fritillaries can be quite really quite variable in the numbers of offspring that successfully make it to maturity uh, that can sometimes be an inherent uh, product of their biology Sometimes it can be due to them being predated or parasitized. Um, others are like a metronome every year. Um, mm. And when we get the magnificent annual report and those variation in numbers, some of those variations are actually down to these factors as well. Um, mm. So for the species that I talked about today, they've all got relatively stable dynamics year to year you, you saw the data in your, yourself in the in the in the plots um but uh that isn't to say that their management is really you know much much more straightforward like um yeah i think we're still learning about a lot of the aspects of the biology for most of the species yeah well thank you thank you very much Andy, got a question from Dennis. Can the host plant development get out of sync with the butterfly development due to climate change? Yeah, that's, I mean, it, I mean, it, yeah, another great question. Um, so we suspect that um, uh, if you, if we didn't have the restoration projects to bring the, for example, like the raised bogs in the Lakeland Peninsulas back into condition, that climate change may actually um, have a slightly less direct impact on that species via bringing those Areophorum uh, plants, you know, the hare's tail, and sometimes the common cotton into uh, like um, worsening their condition over time. And that's about the hydrology of the overall site and also the stress, therefore, that the um, those plants are under in a particular given year. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the, the short answer is yes, it certainly can. Um, disentangling those are the sorts of things that you probably need a site or landscape level study to do. Um, one which I'd absolutely love to do, um, but uh, like I say, it's very difficult to get uh, the go ahead on these things. So yeah, one for the future maybe. Okay, got any more questions? No, I don't think so. Well, can I thank you once again, Andy, for taking some time out to, uh, to talk to us about what is a, uh, a fascinating area and obviously affects the butterflies that we find in, in this part of the world. So um, we'll uh, wait and see what happens, I guess. So particularly um, the, the Northern Brown Argus being very close to my heart. I'm well aware of all the detail of that and obviously knowing that you're going to find it all the way up where you are now. It won't be long before it crosses the Scottish border, I wouldn't have thought. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was totally shown up when uh, someone told me it was near Blythe, which is just down yeah. the road. So I need to go looking for it now. <laughs> yeah. So before everybody else drops off, um, just to remind you, we've got two more talks left in this winter session. The first one is on Monday, the 28th of February which is Dr. Dave Wainwright's going to be giving on moth strategy for Yorkshire. And then on March the 14th, uh, Dr. Mark Collins is going to be talking about the British swallowtail, the subspecies, uh, under threat from sea level rise and invading subspecies. So hopefully we'll get to hear a number of you or we'll get a number of you joining us for that as well. So uh, there'll be emails going out to remind people about it. So, uh, so thanks again, Andy. And uh, I suggest we'll get Nick to stop the recording now.